actually sync these cameras here. Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangi reporting for the Media Speaks, and it is time again for the massive Fukushima update. Uh, do it once a month, obviously, and um, why, why are we still doing it? Because this is something that affects you. Did you just click on this show by accident? Great. Welcome aboard. Kick your feet up. Put your feet on the coffee table. I don't care. But pay attention because it matters. And I'll tell you why it matters. This is an ongoing nuclear disaster that has been pushed to the back pages because of Ferguson, been pushed to the back pages of something that happened three years ago. The Four years. The problem with that is almost four. The problem with that line of thinking, though, is that in terms of radionucleides that will poison the planet for millions of years? This happened two days ago. This happened a couple hours ago. Millions of years. The disaster is already genetically altering the DNA of men and women. And if you don't believe me, well, who am I? I'm somebody that knows how to read. Look up Helen Caldicott. Look up Chris Busby. Go ahead, look up Helen Caldicott, uh genetic damage radiation. And then when you find out I'm not lying to you, you'll be tuning back in. We're going to start with uh, Fukushima and then work our way west. Uh, last time I explained, uh, or to the west, I should say, because last time I started with America and went to Japan. Uh, and again, most of this has to do with either Fukushima or scenarios that, for whatever reason, are showing that we haven't learned anything from Chernobyl, Fukushima, the Cold War, none of it. This is from FukushimaUpdate.com. British researcher blasts UN report on Fukushima cancer risk as unscientific. How many times have we talked on this show about the ways in which... The ways in which... They're covering up exactly how bad this is. The ways that they're saying, oh, it's fine, it's fine, just relax, everything is good, go to sleep. Um, anytime anybody has to come out th with this illogic that every single bit of evidence that comes out that isn't from a doctor who's tied into Fukushima has said that this is a disaster of untold proportions. But all of those studies are wrong, right? The only studies that are right are the ones that tell you to go to sleep because everything is just fine. Well, let's, let's see how fine it is here. This is December 2nd, 2014. That's today. It's like two hours old. You want news? This is news. It's two hours old. A British scientist who studied the health effects of the 1986 Chernobyl disaster panned a United Nations report that virtually dismissed the possibility of higher cancer rates caused by the 2011 Fukushima nuclear crisis. That's because the UN is tied into the neck with the nuclear industry. Oh, Sam, that's a conspiracy theory. It is not a conspiracy theory. They subsidize, that is, give money to the nuke plants to open. They maybe they uh, they get some kind of sweet deal tax wise to open the nuke plant. Why? Because they are uninsurable. That is why. Absolutely uninsurable. So the government will pay for these nuke plants to be here because there's a lot of money to be made in it when it's not melting down or poisoning the atmosphere. Who do you think makes up the UN? Leaders of countries. Okay. Didn't I just explain to you the way that leaders of countries are tied into the tax? It's, it all goes back to the, where's the money go? There's a lot of money to be made lying to you. 
Um, Keith Baverstock, 73, made the comments during a visit to Tokyo at the invitation of a citizens group related to the Fukushima disaster. And let's remember that the black gook that uh, they're finding all over the ground, the mush and gush, the black stuff is the core. That is known as a melt through. It was an atomic explosion at Fukushima. The hydrogen was uh, radioactive and exploded. And parts of it are in this black goo that's all over, uh, or at least was all over Tokyo. Monstrous, monstrously radioactive. Don't believe me? Look it up on Fairwinds. Arnie Gunderson. In response to questions from the Ashahi Shimbun, Baverstock said a report released in April by the UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, its NSEER, was not qualified to be called scientific because it lacked transparency and independent verification. He added that the committee should be disbanded. I, I would agree. The people that are tied into the nuke industry are saying, don't worry, our meltdown isn't hurting anything. Trust us. The UN report said any increase in overall cancer rates among residents of Fukushima Prefecture due to fallout from the accident is unlikely. Yeah, even though we saw it in Chernobyl, look up Belarus if you think I'm making it up after Chernobyl. It's, it's ongoing. <coughs> We've imagined the, um, the problem that we're seeing in Japan now. We've imagined, and I don't mean the meltdown here, I mean the, we saw these effects after the uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We saw these effects of people that were hit with bomb testing. Um, ever hear of John Wayne? Good. He made a movie called The Conqueror. And almost, oh I forget, I, damn near everybody that uh, died in that movie died of cancer that can be directly related to the bomb testing that had been going on in that area. So this is just another one of those coincidences here at Fukushima. Isn't that amazing? All these coincidences. It says, however, Baverstock, former head of the Radiation Protection Program at the World Health Organization's regional office for Europe, said radiation levels shown in the report were enough to cause a spike in cancer rates. For example, the report said nearly 10,000 workers at the crippled Fukushima 1 nuclear plant were exposed to radiation levels exceeding 10 millisieverts over about 18 months following the outbreak of the crisis in March of 2011. Baverstock said such an exposure level was enough to cause an increase in cancer among about 50 of the workers. He's got all the science behind it. Go ahead and look up the study. I'm just letting you know what is out there. And, it, 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 and the reason I say this is I, I get people implying that this is somehow my opinion when there are all these sources that I give all the way through it. After studying the effects from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, it goes on, Baverstock was the first to point out an increase in thyroid cancer among residents of areas hit by radioactive fallout. Fast forward now, that was 86, fast forward now to 2014, and we're seeing these thyroid issues on children all over that area of Japan. Isn't that just astounding, the coincidence? He also uh, questioned Yoon Sears and neutrality, given that members were nominated by United Nation, by nations excuse me, that have a vested interest in nuclear power. He noted that such nations provide funds to the committee. Oh, well, Sam, you're a conspiracy theorist to make this up. I didn't make it up. Baverstock also suggested a conflict of interest, as committee members are not required to disclose their history working in the nuclear industry or sign pledges stating that no conflict of interest exists in evaluating radiation risks. Therefore, they, could, they're, they are invested into the neck in these stocks, and they don't even have to write down that they're tied to the nuclear industry. And their study just happens to find out that everything is okay. Baverstock said that when he was working for the World Health Organization, he felt constant pressure from the International Atomic Energy Agency, a major promoter of nuclear power. 
He also questioned why it took more than three years for Yun Sear to release its Fukushima report. Referring to what he called inside information, he raised the possibility that the delay was caused by criticism about the report's conclusion and the influence over other UN agencies such as the IEA. It's right there. You are being lied to uh, about what you should be eating, which is nothing from Japan. Avoid food from California. Don't give me this BS that California is fine. Yes, we all eat it and drink it to some regard, but the goal is to limit it as much as you can. The less becquerels you can get inside of you, the healthier you're going to be. You shouldn't be living uh, in Fukushima, anywhere near Fukushima. Tokyo is really not the safest place to be. This is uh, e and &E News. Fukushima worker, they're covering up how much contamination is flowing into the ocean. Scientists, we are measuring high radiation levels off Japan. The plume near California already exceeds expectations and will we'll keep raising, rising for years to come. On TV said the cleanup can't be done. They lied from the start. TEPCO is a den of iniquity. Why does that matter so very much, you ask? Because I'm going to give it to you with this article. Keep in mind what I just said to you. Massive amounts of radiation are going into the water and they're lying about how much it is. I just explained to you what radiation does and how they're covering up the health effects of the cancers that it's causing. Well, how about we drink the ocean water? You can't drink ocean water, Sam. It's got salt in it. They have found a way to remove the salt from the water and thankfully most of the chemicals that are bad for you. That's the good news. I'm a big fan of desalinization. That is taking the salt out of water and drinking it. If it's not the Pacific Ocean, this shouldn't be done anywhere on the North Equator if it's going to be done at all. This should not be done in the Pacific Ocean. Um, it, it, can anybody get this video to Chris Busby? Uh, anybody? It, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but these chemicals are not radionuclides. They could potentially here be giving you water out of the contaminated Pacific Ocean, of which we've covered the tuna that are glowing. All of the tuna tested are radioactive um, to a much higher degree than they are in other oceans. Don't give me background radiation. Um, mass die-offs up and down the coast. Cancer through the roof. Radiation leaking into the water. And now they're going to have you drink it. Christina Sarich, PrisonPlanet.com the process of making seawater potable water desalinization has been a significant point of research for years in order to purify water. While there have been new technologies that aim at making seawater drinkable, many of our oceans, lakes, and rivers have become highly contaminated due to pesticide and industrial fertilizer ground and water penetration, runoff, as well as contaminated from petrochemicals, and other corporate industry polluters. In other words, it's a chemical poison. Luckily, researchers at the Massachusetts Technology Institute, MIT, just might have the solution to the problem. And this, again, there's a million ways that this is good news, but I never once hear them say what ocean they're doing it in or whether or not it removes radionuclides. MIT scientists have created sheets of graphene, a one atom thick form of element carbon, it's very thin, which they say can be far more efficient and possibly less expensive than existing desalination systems. If they can take the salt, it says, out of the water, they just might be able to take glosphite, GMA, GMO pesticides, neonics, and other unsavory chemicals out of our waterways too. This is all excellent news until you realize, again, which ocean, please tell me, not nothing. Does it take out the radionuclides? Nothing. So they won't give you cancer from the chemicals, but the radio radioactivity will kill you dead. I don't know. That's why I'm reporting it. This is alarming to me. 
It says a paper describing the new process in the journal Nano Letters concluded, quote, overall our results indicate that the water permeability of the material is several orders of magnitude, that means times 10, higher than conventional reserve osmosis membranes, and that nanoforous graphene may have a valuable role to play in water purification. What's that mean? It means that now that they know that they're able to do this, it's very likely it'll be much much easier to obtain than other ways that they've ever done this. And it'll be a lot cheaper, which will be beneficial. Desalinization of water has been an expensive endeavor up until now, but the technology created by MIT would reduce not only desalinating ocean waters, but possibly inexpensively filtering carcinogenic chemicals out of them, which is good news. It's not all bleak here. Jeffrey Grossman, the... Carl Richard Soderberg, Associate Professor of Power Engineering at MIT's Department of Materials Science and Engineering, who is the senior author of the paper, says there are not that many people working on desalination with the materials point of view. If water can pass through the graphene sheets while capturing sodium and chlorine ions, why not pesticide molecules like DDT, uh, phrythum, rotein, cyprum, so yeah, cypermethrin, I don't know what the last two are, and other pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides. A paper from the Chemical Process Engineering Research Institute Center for Research and Technology in Hellas, Thessaloniki, Greece, has already detailed some successful efforts at removal from pesticides and uh, portable wa potable water, potable water sources. The trouble here as I've said repeatedly, is it doesn't say what it does with radiation. You're going to want to know where you're getting your bottled water from in the future, it looks like. Um, I'm sure I have like the, the smartest people ever listen to this show, so do me a favor in the comment line, people smarter than me, let me know if this would take out all radionuclides. If it only takes out some, that's not helping us any. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Don't zone out because I'm about to get into all kinds of news regarding how this affects you beyond Japan. This isn't just about Japan here. But before I do, I want to invite you to go to the Arcadia Grill. You can find them in downtown Canton, located on Court Avenue. When you go in there, make sure you tell Maria, or whoever seats you, it'll likely be Maria, that you heard about the show. You heard about the restaurant, I should say, on the show, on the correct views. Order a drink, it'll be made perfectly, exactly like you asked for it, only better. <laughs> You'll be getting uh, delicious food, ravioli, the best Italian bread you've ever eaten at the Arcadia Grill on Court Avenue in downtown Canton. Carefully go there, my friends, if you're from another state. Oh, what the hell, drive over. The food is worth it. Moving on to the last part of the Fukushima update, brought to you by Mike McLaughlin, one of the best fiction writers extant today. Look him up on Facebook, Mike McLaughlin in Ohio. This is from TheEcologist.org. Leaked Sellafield photos reveal massive radioactive release threat. This is Oliver Tickell. Dilapidated nuclear waste storage ponds abandoned 40 years ago containing hundreds of tons of fuel rods pose an immediate danger to public safety. Photographs sent to The Ecologist reveal. And they're on the, uh, again, on the site I just gave you. The fuel and sludge in the ponds could spontaneously ignite if exposed to air, spreading intense radiation over a wide area. The ecologist has received a shocking set of leaked images showing decrepit and grossly inadequate storage facilities for high-level nuclear waste at the Seffield nuclear plant. The images from the anonymous source, or they'd probably kill him like they did uh, Karen Silkwood if they found out uh, who it was. I hope it stays anonymous. Show that the state of spent nuclear fuel storage ponds that were commissioned in 1952 and used until the mid-1970s as short-term storage for spent fuel. Short-term, it's the 70s. Until it could be reprocessed, producing plutonium for military use. It's all about the war. All about uh, the. Who, we'll get to more on that later. However, they were completely abandoned in the mid 1970s and have been left derelict for almost 40 years. Yeah, no chance that a terrorist would ever want to knock that over. It's all perfectly safe. Just go to sleep. 
The photographs show cracked concrete tanks holding water contaminated with high levels of radiation. Seagulls bathing in the water. Broken equipment, dangerous mess of discarded items on elevated walkways, and weeds growing around the tanks. Why does it matter? It matters because other things eat the seagulls. It means because if the seagull, and I, this is what I'm going to say is not an exaggeration. The seagull could shed a feather anywhere. On your car, you step on it, you, it's in your backyard, who knows? The grocery store, who knows? The seagull drops the feather, and he's got the tiniest bit of plutonium. I mean the tiniest bit. Do you know that a teaspoon of plutonium equally dispersed over all of North America would kill almost, almost the entire country in less than a year? Well, not kill, I'm sorry. would infect, I, I misspeak, no but teleprompter here. It would begin within the first year to create defects and would kill most of North America, I think it said within uh, 100 years. But it would start immediately, and uh, some studies have guesstimated that it could be as little as 50 years. Dead. That's how deadly plutonium is. No, you can't just put it in a teaspoon and blow it. It would, you would collapse when you got near it. The point is, it takes a tiny little speckle from a seagull, from an anything, get it breathed in, that could give you, as Helen Caldicott says, just a routine cancer. Well, these are routine releases. The seagulls are bathing in the water. You got a bird bath? Does your kids play around the bird bath? Are you seeing why this sort of matters? Does your dog go out there and chase the bird and it drops feathers all over the place? It is that carcinogenic. Look up plutonium if right now you're thinking that I'm some kind of an alarmist. The fuel storage pond is the largest measuring 20 meters wide, 150 meters long, and 6 meters deep, are now completely packed with spent fuel in disastrously poor condition. If the ponds drain, the spent fuel may spontaneously ignite. The ponds are now undergoing decommissioning in order to restore them to safe condition, but the process is fraught with danger. And nuclear expert John Large warns that massive and uncontrolled radioactive releases to the environment could occur. This pond is built above ground, he said. It's like a concrete dock full of water. But the concrete is in dreadful condition, degraded and fractured. And if the ponds drain, the Magnox fuel that is uh, some of the most, that might be the most toxic uh, creation in the uh, entire earth, Magnox fuel, will ignite and would lead to a massive release of radioactive material. Looking at the photos, I am very disturbed at the degraded and rundown condition of the structures and the support services. In my opinion, there is a significant risk that the system could fail. If you got a breach above the wall by accident or by terrorist attack, the Magnox fuel would burn. I would say there's many hundreds of tons in there. It would give rise to a very big radioactive release. It's not for me to make comparisons with Chernobyl or Fukushima, but it would certainly cause serious contamination over a wide area for a very long time. It says the state of the fuel is very unstable. They were abandoned after they were overwhelmed with spent fuel in 1974. Prime Minister Edward Heath three-day week when coal miners were on strike causing fuel shortages in Britain's power stations. So basically, you know, we just kind of forgot about it and this happened and that happened and, and now the next thing you know it's about to fall over and poison your entire nation. All right, how about Russia? How about uh, Russia and Obama just skipping right into World War III? This matters because Russia has already had major, major nuclear disasters. Uh, look up Mavec, and most people don't even know about it. The skin was sloughing off their bones, um, to quote Wikipedia. There is also the Chernobyl incident, which we all know about. Well, now, Russia to build Iran nuclear reactors. There are two reasons why Iran should not have a nuclear power plant. First of all, it's the same reason Israel shouldn't. 
there's another problem with Iran's, but I'll get to that in point two. But Israel and Iran have made a huge mistake. Uh, Iran has built, and uh, Iran is building, and Israel has built a nuclear power plant in a war zone. It's worse for Arab lands because you have Arabs blowing up other Arabs. You don't really see that so much. You don't want really to see Jews blowing up other Jews. I'm sure there's some instance, somebody will find one and point it out to me how wrong I was. By and large, it doesn't happen. You do have that in Iran. So that's one problem. Second of all, Iran is sitting atop the what is what is thought to be perhaps the most soon to be active massive earthquake fault zone in the world. This was predicted with the earthquake that took out one of the reactors before the tidal wave hit any of them. An earthquake, therefore, can cause a meltdown without a tidal wave. We learned that in Fukushima. When Iran has this nuclear incident, it's going to poison the entire Middle East, far worse than anything that Israel is going to do with a launch. This is going to be a real nightmare. They've already had attacks there. Maybe Israel did it. Maybe other Arab factions did it. Now they've got the earthquake risk. So Russia has decided that this here is a wonderful idea. And it says they have signed a contract to build two more nuclear reactors in Iran, likely to be followed with another six, a move intended to cement closer ties between the two nations. Yeah, you'll be tied in the fact that you've poisoned your own people with uh, nuclear meltdowns. Congratulations. The deal comes less than two weeks ahead of the November 24th deadline for Tehran to sign an agreement on its nuclear program with six world powers. As the world moves away from nuclear power, Iran moves into it. They're going to be in the same boat France is in. France is so reliant on it that they are going to have a, a horrible, horrible time uh, with their nuclear power plants there. Mark my words. But at least they don't have uh, religious factions blowing it up and they're not, not sitting on what we know of to be a horrible earthquake zone. Tuesday's contract has no immediate relation to the talks that involve Russia and the U.S., but it reflects Moscow's intention to deepen its cooperation with Tehran ahead of possible softening of Western sanctions against Iran. The nuclear officials from the two countries signed the contract for building two reactors at Iran's first Russia-built plant in Bershur. And if you don't already believe that they've had nuclear incidents there in just the building of it, then look it up. And again, that's not even saying, that we're saying that uh, our nation's official stance, I guess, is that Iran wants to use it as a bomb. I wouldn't be surprised if they wanted to use it as a dirty bomb against Israel. But it looks more and more that uh, it could be a possibility that they would be using it against themselves, you know, different factions within their own religion. All right, guys, I want to get to this real quick. Uh, two more stories to get to. Ten signs that Russia is preparing to fight and win a nuclear war with the United States. Um, I'm going to zip through these. It's by Michael Snyder, End of the American Dream. He changed the name of the, uh, the article I see there. I'm going to do these quickly. One, Russia is spending an enormous amount of money to develop PAKDA, Strategic Bomber. Not a lot is known about this stealth bomber at the time. The following summary of what we know comes from an Australian news source. It says it's his answer to the B-2 spirit. Next generation strategic bomber is intended to be almost invisible to radar and capable of carrying a huge array of conventional and nuclear missiles. Little else is known and its expected service date is 2025. Now, my guess is that America is working on these things as well. Um, everyone knows that there has been a Russian bomber, I hope you know, within uh, mere miles of the American coast, and we didn't know it was there until the last minute. It was so quiet. Well, there's no reason to believe that we don't have submarines that are also that quiet, and that Russia doesn't even know are there. So this notion that Russia is so far against us isn't something that's necessarily true. However... We do have the most competent, incompetent presidency in the history here with Obama and his administration. The only one worse with Bush. So, I mean, it's possible they are this far ahead of us. Uh, two, the Russian nuclear bombers have been regularly buzzing areas in northern Europe and along the coast of Alaska. The Russians appear to be brazenly testing NATO defenses. That's a wonderful way to start a nuclear war. 
Um, also, let's not forget, some people have argued that Russia is taking over areas in much the same way that Hitler did, uh, how he took over massive amounts of land before actually bombing anyone. Am I saying that Putin is Hitler? I'm saying that Obama and Putin are two sides of the same evil coin. Just because Putin isn't as in deeply invested into the New World Order as we are does not mean he's on the side of love and puppies. Three, Russian Defense Minister Sergei, your bird, Sergei, Sergei Sergu says that Russian nuclear bombers will now conduct regular patrols in the Western Atlantic and Eastern Pacific, as well as Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. This is the Cold War all over again. Russia is constructing four, an anti-ballistic missile, missile system, which is supposedly superior to anything that the U.S. currently has. Is that true? We don't know. But this is another step towards what could be some kind of a nuclear altercation. Even if I don't agree that America is that far behind, any exchange would be detrimental. And look up correct views, uh, nuclear bombs, war, it, it, I've covered it extensively. Five, Russia recently successfully test launched a new submarine-based intercontinental ballistic missile. It says a Russian northern fleet a uh, nuclear submarine on Wednesday fire tested an intercontinental missile from the Barrett Sea to the country's far eastern Kuga range of Kamchatka. Six, Russia already possesses super silent nuclear attack submarines that are virtually undetectable when submerged. Seven, Russia media outlets are reporting that 60% of all Russian nuclear missiles will have radio evading capacity by 2016. And for the first time ever, Russia has more strategic nuclear warheads deployed than the U.S. does. Nine, Russia has a massive advantage over the U.S. and NATO when it comes to tactical nuclear weapons. And ten, Russia...